All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from, well, actually a wet and rainy San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Jamie Shanks, who's up in Toronto, Canada. Hope you're getting better weather there than we are. <laughs> I'm in the wettest, coldest place you could imagine right now. <laughs> well, here it's starting to look like back home in Ireland, to be honest. It's getting so rainy. <laughs> And Jamie's the founder and CEO of Pipeline Signals, which aims to support companies in growing their business pipeline at scale through relationship signals and signal intelligence. Uh, a decade before founding Pipeline Signals, Jamie founded Sales for Life, the world's most extensive social selling training program for mid-market and enterprise companies. Also authored two books, Social Selling Mastery and Spear Selling, the Ultimate Account-Based Sales Guide for the modern digital seller. And what we're going to talk about today is the value and importance of mining and researching your active customer prospect and competitors' accounts. Uh, so, um, Jamie, maybe just bottom line this for, for people. You know, when you, when you say mining and researching active customer prospect and, and competitor accounts, people might go, well, well yeah, well, I, I do research, you know. So, I mean, we do some research. I mean, what do you mean by this? So imagine you're a scaled organization, you have hundreds of customers, your total addressable market is made up of thousands of prospects. Now, one of the biggest challenges where most sellers fail is in the prospecting efforts, their account selection and their account prioritization models are off. They're very subjective, right? They mm -hmm. yeah. lick their finger, put it in the wind, and they say, let's call all the accounts by revenue or by sexy logo or like some <laughs> other arbitrary subjective factor. What we're doing is saying, how about you call companies that are changing? Human capital migration is, if you follow people into businesses, those people are trying to make change in a business. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine reverse engineering your happy customers. You look at people that leave your customer base, they'll go to other customers, They'll go to named prospects you're working. But they'll also go to what's called the green field. So accounts you never even considered. So this customer on the move sales play has been working forever. It just hadn't been digitized. Yeah. And so now you can monitor it at endless scale. Yeah, no, it makes total sense because often you'll hear people come across and they'll say, oh, uh, you know, Jamie, oh, who used to work for ABC, he, he just contacted me, he moved, whatever, and he wants, he's interested. and which shows that that does happen. But as you say, I mean, it tends to be random. It just tends to be either either they reach out or maybe you see something on LinkedIn, but it's not systematized. Yeah, you're trying to turn this into a definitive sales play so that A, your CRM is growing, not shrinking, mm -hmm. just statistically. The average CRM decays at 3% a month. That means you take all the contacts in your CRM, that's how often people in the Western world are changing jobs. Mm -hmm. So it's naturally going through a decay. You're counterbalancing that by growing it with all the changes. Number two, your sellers are now systematically calling asymmetric competitive advantages, meaning you have a relationship in these accounts. They are a fan, a champion. Why wouldn't you call them first? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, aim your you know, your rifle at those type of accounts. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So how does uh, how does your product help do this? Uh, because it sounds, I mean, it's a great idea, but I mean, I'd say a lot of people are going, yeah, but how do I actually go about doing this? It's actually really simple, three-step process. So in onboarding, our customers tell us the what we'll call the rules to the road. Mm -hmm. So what are the job, uh, the job titles, the functions, the roles and responsibilities you sell to? What does your ideal customer profile look like? And then they upload, here are the list of our customers, our prospects, and then the rules to the road. If somebody goes into what's called a Greenfield account, what does ideal look like to us? So that's step one. Yeah. Step two, we go into the market and we track all 900 million LinkedIn profiles. That is the catalyst to where the waterfall begins, that mm -hmm. user-generated change. And we're cross-correlating and reverse engineering every account through technology to figure out, okay, if somebody left happy customer A, what customer did they go into B? We turn that data, like unstructured data into sales intelligence. 
You can have that in a CSV file, or you can have it swept into any CRM. Pipeliner CRM is an example. Using Zapier integration automatically goes into the CRM as a lead, a contact, and a task. Step number three. Now you have the sales intelligence in your hand. We have to ensure accountability to the sales intelligence we've given you. Yeah. We provide social selling mastery and spear selling training unlimited to all your sellers, free as part of all of this, because our job is to ensure you're turning these leads into sales qualified leads. And what that does is that creates an accountability program to actually create pipeline at scale. Mm -hmm. No, that's uh, it, it's fascinating because I mean, as you alluded to earlier, I mean the the amount of people moving today has increased like exponentially, especially now that people are sort of selecting where they're going to live, where they're going to locate themselves, and then go looking for jobs. So rather than the other way around, where you used to locate yourself where the jobs were, now you locate yourself yeah. where you want to be, where you want to live, and yeah. you go find the jobs. So I think. It's it's people are jumping jobs a lot quicker now because they have different criteria. Yes, and we also want to target what we call the window of change. So mm -hmm. let's think logically about anyone listening to this. If you've ever been new to a role in an organization, day zero through 30, you're wandering around the office, either physically or virtually, <laughs> trying to figure out where's the washroom, mm -hmm. what are my goals, like, what am I trying to do here? But on day 31 through day 100 is the beautiful window of change. This is where an executive starts thinking, okay, I need to bring in new people, process and technology. I can look from my past vendors that I've used. I can look to the future and explore new ideas because I know at day 100, I'm going to be sitting in a boardroom explaining my one year plan to the ELT and I'm going to get our budget. And then I'm going to need to deploy that remitted budget. And it's much easier to shake the trees in day 30 to day 100 than it is day 180 when somebody's already four programs deep into their priorities. Taking somebody off of their priority list is difficult. Setting up somebody's priorities is much easier. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, I think that's an excellent point because let's face it, I mean, once you, as you said, once you've found where the bathroom is, or if you're virtual, I hope you'd already know where it was. But, uh, <laughs> um, but once you get through that phase, yeah, that's exactly. I mean, I even look back on my own, you know, career when I came in. You played. That's the time when you really want to say, okay, how can I bring added value? How can I leverage my relationships? Because that's part of why you probably got hired in the first place. Um, but if I don't have a, if nobody reaches out to me, or if I don't have any systematic way of doing that, or I'm not, you know, you, you're not top of mind, I may default to somebody else. And yeah, you'll go with what you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so then, how, uh, you know, once you once you have this data and you have these people targeted, um, is there? You know, given that your background with your sales training and that, are what are the elegant ways of engaging then with people as they move on? I think that first it starts with a strategic storyboarding and then it moves to the tactical messaging. Strategic storyboarding. And this is where I see sellers go wrong. Mm -hmm. Number one, they'll create touch point number one. And touch point number one might look really great, but touch point number two, two, three, four, five to N is the message basically says, oh, did you get my first message? And it's like reverting back to original message one. Mm -hmm. So the only value they, they had was that first original message. And then every other subsequent message was just like, hey, did you know, following up on my last email, zero value from message two and beyond. So what we want to do is back up and build a storyboard and a storyboard like think about like cartoon storyboards or movie storyboards, mm -hmm. five boxes, six boxes. And what we're going to do is draw out what is a scenario or an idea we want to plant in our prospects' minds. Right. It might be around competitive intelligence. The next one might be about benchmarking. The next one might be uh, pontificating the future one year from now. The next one might be a video visual of the first 100 days of success. And so imagine you actually identify all these great scenes to a movie. Then in step two, you fill in the scenes. Now, mm -hmm. I believe there's a four structured message process. We can get into that in a second if you'd like. But first, it starts 
with storyboarding unique ideas before you get engaging. Yeah, no, I, I agree because I, I think today, obviously, there's so much noise and there's so much sp spam and, uh, and and stuff just flooding in everywhere. But if you're not, if you don't put enough effort and thought into what you're communicating, as you said, like by storyboarding or whatever, is you're just going to get lost in the noise. And I think the the great thing today, though, is is when things hit the target, they stand out twenty million times the way they used. To. <laughs> they do. I mean, you know, and the details within the message. So mm -hmm. I am a huge believer, as you can imagine, of the power of video within mm -hmm. those messages. Um, I'm a believer that um, people want a story of us versus them, David versus Goliath. You're going to want to share studies, benchmarks, competitive intelligence. These are things that, because ultimately when you're trying to book a meeting, yep. what sellers forget is you're not trying to sell a product or solution. You're trying to acquire time. So mm -hmm. John, you're the prospect, I'm the yep. seller. My goal is to acquire 30 minutes on your calendar next Thursday at two o'clock. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to move the ball, you know, American football, mm -hmm. move the ball 10 yards. So to do that, I'm trying to acquire time. And the only thing that I can give you to acquire that time from you is knowledge. Yeah. And that knowledge needs to be so great that you are going to weigh the opportunity cost of what you were going to do next Thursday versus learning more about this so it has to be something juicy and exciting where somebody's like oh my god like i'll give up next thursday to learn more about that mm -hmm. yeah and and obviously in order to, in order to do that then you have to really understand uh you have to understand where your customer prospect or whatever is where they're in what their priorities needs and all of that kind of thing you need to at least be able to figure out a message that's going to break through and and i think in the early days as you said like you know after the after the first 30 days or so we're very open to outside help because we're not completely embedded in where we are right now we don't know necessarily where all the pitfalls, the landmines, the challenges are. We don't know what the competing initiatives are. So we're setting a course. Now, you could argue then that you they could you could be setting up a course of plan of actions that ultimately will get derailed once they start talking to cross-functional mm -hmm. departments. I mean, there's only so much you can control. Yeah. But, you know, a 17-year vet no is more battle hardened inside a business and they're like nah you know what i'm not willing to put up that fight internally i've done that one six times you know you yeah. want the the new champion who's like i don't care what the internal politics are i'm going to win and i'm going to do it my way mm -hmm. so it's uh, so uh you know, researching and, and looking and uh, at active customers and prospects, the, the one that's fascinating is competitive accounts. Like, talk me through a little bit about how you would how you would use that information. The way that I see it is companies like I, I'm drinking. Uh, there's a grocery store <laughs> in Canada called Farm Boy, and I'm drinking one of their like lemon bubbly drinks. Okay, <laughs> so you're compete. You want to sell into Farm Boy. And at the end of the day, Farm Boy, the grocery ch store chain, doesn't get out of bed every day and think up new ideas, initiatives, and programs. Mm -hmm. It's the people within those businesses. So if it's people that make decisions, follow the people. Well, if, we've already talked about like these asymmetric competitive advantages for you, meaning, wow, somebody has left a happy customer of yours and gone into that account. Well, the inverse is true. There are people that are working at companies you know use your competitors or even worse they were previously employed by your competitor mm -hmm. and they leave and they go into a new business so when they get there who do you think they're going to fend for exactly their past employer and in fact i've got a, a funny not a funny a kind of a crazy story about this we were at a it services company's sales kickoff i always run this account-based workshop kind of we put everybody in pods or teams and they do key account planning and everybody was assigned an account. And at one of the tables, the assigned account was Harley Davidson. So we get about a half an hour into this session and I see one of the ladies at the table, like 
literally start to cry. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what's going on? And she says, well, I have been working the Harley Davidson account for eight months. And it only took me five minutes to use LinkedIn to reverse engineer to figure out that the chief operating officer that was recently hired there used to work at our competitor. And now I know every time I was, <clears throat> you know, throwing in a proposal for this or that, it would get shot down at the 11th hour. Well, it's because mm -hmm. the person that's signing that deal would look at it and go, oh, we're not hiring them. Yep. Will you, Frank, my friend over at my old employer, let's call Frank. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, it's all publicly available data if you know how to harness it. Yeah. So that's fascinating. So therefore, um, you could say, okay, well, clearly, uh, you know, Jamie came from one of our competitors, um, uh, and things are getting blocked. Therefore I should probably move on at this stage. I should probably say that this isn't a good prospect for me. Account selection and prioritization has its own opposite is deselection yep. or deprioritization. And you know, as, as important it is to pick the accounts you want to go after, it's also through deductive reasoning, equally important to scratch off the list of the ones that you're going to spin your wheels on. Mm -hmm. And it's the ones that there's no compelling event there. There's no reason to change. There's no human capital migration. There's no past customers in those accounts. There's no new executive movement. Um, and in fact, you might even have detractors in the account because there's competitors or people that have used your competitors inside those accounts. You may want, so sub, that's the heart and the mind. Yeah. Subjectively, your mind is like, oh man, I'm like, here's my Yeti water ball. <laughs> yeah, I, everybody in the world wants to win Yeti as a customer. That doesn't mean we all can win Yeti. Mm -hmm. you know what? You'll have to go win Igloo Cooler or Coleman, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, no, and I, and I think that's a great point because uh, as you said, um, we love to fill our pipelines with stuff and we love to say, well, I'm, I've gotten so far down the road with this, with this, uh, with this prospect and yeah, it's going to come through and oh, there's another delay or that. But to your point, if you were able to say, oh, I can see why it's, this is only going so far. That's huge. Think of the amount of time energy, uh, that you would save yourself, not to mention, uh, you know, your forecast would be a little more accurate. Well, it's called the endowment effect. And the endowment effect is, and we'll use this shirt as an example mm -hmm. to, to simplify it. The endowment effect means that once you've sunk time, money, and energy into something, so I maybe paid $200 for this shirt, let's mm -hmm. say. Let's say it never fit or I never liked the color. And it sat in my closet for months or seasons. And I would always look at it and go, oh, I should just throw that out. But I won't yeah. because you remember that you spent $200 on it. But if it was for sale... At a thrift store right now, I wouldn't pay $20 for it. <laughs> and us sellers, we go through the endowment effect every day where we fall in love with the energy we put into past customers or prospects. But if we were to come in with fresh eyes, we wouldn't spend five minutes on it. Mm. Yeah, and I think that I think that's a really, really important point because, I mean, you know from – from working with sales teams that some of the times the hardest things to do is to get people to just admit that this isn't going anywhere because there's always that, you know, I would say it says people, you know, happy years hear what we hear. We want to say we're all, you know, eternal optimists on, on things. Um, but the amount of time and energy that's wasted on, on accounts that don't go anywhere is, is incredible. So I think anything nowadays, you always say, uh, the one thing you can't create more of is time, but actually you can if you're smart about it. <laughs> and you know, I do this religiously mm -hmm. in my new company, Pipeline Signals. You know, at Sales for Life, it became for 10 years, and Sales for Life still exists. We license mm -hmm. that IP to global enterprise companies, but mm -hmm. for the average small, medium, lower, you know, uh, lower mid market, upper mid market company, they come to Pipeline Signals. And you know, over that learning in year one. The, in 2021, when we first started winning deals, the average deal took 90 days. In 2022, of all the customers we won, the average deal took 38 days. Wow. And so now, every quarter, I clean out, or actually it's every month, but looking at it from a quarter snapshot, I clean out the pipeline coverage. Objectively, I don't care how sexy the logo is. I don't care 
how much time and energy I've spent on that deal. If it doesn't close in, in 90 days, because we're a $3,000 a month subscription, this is not, you know, you know, we are not millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. If, if it's not a priority in one quarter, it's never going to be a priority for quite some time. Yeah. So there's focus on 90 day chunks and that's helps. That's a, that's a form of objective focus that we just kick it out of pipeline. Yeah, because it's it's amazing how much st stuff is just left left in pipelines and just recur, you know, and they keep moving. Oh, I'll just move the close date out and it's exactly. your pipeline. And then you just end up, uh, I, I always love the, we used to call it the, the feel-good funnel. That's what we called it. When I was at Healthway, I think we did a thing on the feel-good funnel was when you you dump a ton of stuff into stage one and maybe stage two it looks very healthy. You're not closing any business right now, but you say, just you wait six months down the road. Oh yeah. You what hold happens? on to me. Yeah. <laughs> and then six months down the road, what happens? You go, well, another six months, but I've more, I've more. <laughs> exactly. Well, listen, Jamie, this has been great. All of Jamie's information is going to be below this video, but before you go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and pipeline signals. Yeah. If you want to know more, um, Pipeline Signals is going to help you in two different ways. One, enable you to self-source and control your own pipeline. So we're prospecting pipeline creation experts, but give you a tailwind of sales intelligence where we actually mine all this intelligence for you and give it to you in reports. Now go to PipelineSignals.com. Happy to talk to you. Excellent. Well, listen, thanks again, Jamie, and thank you for watching and listening. See you all again soon.